Osborne. Yes. Hey, oh, Osp, how are you guys doing? I thought they were going to give me energy. Oh, Osp, how are you doing? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, I'm super, super excited to be here. This is awesome. I cannot tell you. It's been a great day. Have you all had a good day so far? Talks are great. We got, you know, outstanding vendors out there. I've actually spent some time in the vendor hall, which is rare for me. I usually kind of shy away. That's nothing personal, but, you know, that's not where I usually spend most of my time. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Alyssa Miller, as Vendana mentioned. Um, I am the CISO for Epic Global. I have been in tech and cybersecurity for longer than I care to admit. Um, let's, let's just say we're well past two decades. Um, I started as a developer, which is why application security is so important to me. I spent almost a decade doing software development for a large financial services organization before I got into cybersecurity as a career. Now, I've been a hacker all my life. That's, I mean, I can go back to when I was four years old and I took apart, you know, my parents' electronics. They weren't always the biggest fan of that. <laughs> Um, 12 years old, I bought a computer. I broke into Prodigy. Thankfully, back then, people weren't watching. <laughs> so I did not spend any time in jail. And yes, the statute of limitations has expired. I'm safe to talk about that. But today, I want to talk to you guys about application security. Because we've been talking about AppSec for as long as I've been in this industry. So I want to start. I want to take you back in time. Now, does anyone want to venture a guess on what year I'm going to take you back to? 1985? No, not 1988 either. 2000? No. We're going to go to 2003. Why? OWASP, top 10. OWASP, top 10. 2001, OWASP was founded. 2003, OWASP did probably the single most notorious thing, I guess, that OWASP will ever be known for. They launched the initial web application vulnerability top 10. 2003, I was still doing software development at that time. So this is how long we've been talking about application security. This is how long we, in the OWASP community, have been working and building projects and building materials and producing content, hosting events like this, trying to advance the cause of application security. So let's go back to 2003. What did web applications look like back then? Well, that was Amazon. <laughs> the death by tabs Amazon at the time. Apple iTunes. Whew. Forgive me for saying it, I think it still kind of looks like that. Um, that's my little shot at Apple. Um, LinkedIn, did you guys know that LinkedIn existed in 2003 already? Yeah, yeah. And that'll blow your mind because when we look at Facebook, oh yeah, it didn't exist yet. <laughs> but we had MySpace. Tom was everybody's friend on MySpace. Yeah. Those were the days. But this is what our web developers were creating. Everybody wanted to be in on it. We had to get to the web. We had to have our e-commerce sites. That was the big thing. That was the mantra. And we saw that from the OWASP community. And we said, oh my gosh, we got to the start helping these devs out. Because as people were building more and more e-commerce, hackers were doing what? Some of the criminal element does in getting into hacking those sites. But what about mobile apps in 2003? Anybody know when the iPhone was launched? 2006. 2006. Wow, that was, she was like right there too. She's like, it was 2006. I know that one. So do you know what mobile apps looked like back then? Da, 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 da. The BlackBerry 6200. 
Oh, we were rocking. We were writing software for our beds. Some of you actually know what a bed server still is. All right. So yeah, I mean, we, we weren't even into iPhones yet. Smartphones wasn't really a term yet, because even though BlackBerry already had one, no one was calling it that. So this, you know, we, we weren't even thinking about mobile apps yet. So what were we doing in application development at this time? Well, in 2001, the Agile Manifesto was written. And uh, so Agile became this big buzzword. Everybody was excited. We were going to move off a waterfall. We're going Agile development. That was the hot topic back then. And do you know what happened in 2002, what Microsoft did? Does anybody know what Microsoft released in 2002 that impacted developers across the entire world? What's that? What computing? Trustworthy computing? That might have launched in 2002 as well. Ah, uh, might have been. Something that more directly impacted developers than that, though. .NET. .NET came out. Visual Studio .NET 1.0, although they decided to call it 22 instead, um, because Microsoft. Um, so yeah, we were all C++ developers like me who had been working in Visual Studio 4.2 for years. We're suddenly now confronted with this whole new animal. Struts? Anybody? Ooh, we all remember struts. Yeah, struts is a dirty word, especially if you used to work at Equifax. Anybody know what version of struts we were on in, in 2003? 1.1. 1. 1. And struts, of course, was in what programming language, everybody? Java. So does anybody know what version of Java we were on? <laughs> JTOSC 1.2. This was the world in 2003. These were the developers we were working with. This was what they were facing. These were the people we were trying to help write safer, more secure code. So the OWASP top 10 came out. And this was the content. These were the top. And by the way, fun when you try to go searching for this. Unvalidated input, broken access controls, broken authentication and session management, cross-site scripting. Do these sound familiar? More on that to come in a minute. So let's come back to 23. Because let's talk about what happened in the meantime. There's 20 years from when that OWASP top 10 was released to right now. 22 years that OWASP has been around as an organization. So what have we done in that time? Application security testing has become a huge thing for all of us. Kind of the, the, the starting point where we got started when in terms of AppSec was, hey, we're going to test all your apps. And we, then we started creating things like we had SAS tools and DAS tools, because we're, we're going to do dynamic analysis, but that's not really perfect. So then we're going to do SAS, and that's really not perfect. But you know, and then we, we've created this whole infrastructure that has allowed us to find ways to assess software security. Is our software secure? And we found ways to integrate this into our development pipelines. And we've grown that, and it's grown into a, just a really comprehensive suite of activities and things that we do. But then we wanted to get better. We wanted to do more. We got into real-time defenses. Two of the most notable web application firewalls. We still use those today. In fact, those are still, I can tell you personally, those are an invaluable tool that I use every day in my environment when, you know, open source community launches or announces their latest zero day that isn't patched. It's wonderful to have a web application firewall I can mitigate some of those risks with. Or, you know, when my developers decide to launch an API that's unauthenticated and has SQL injection, you know, sometimes that's cool too. Runtime application self-protection. This is a big one that came out years and years ago. And I, I don't think it's yet really caught on. And I know there's some vendors out there who will hate me for that. I'm sure Jeff Williams, if he heard me say that, would be like, come on, contrast security has been doing this for decades. Yeah. But how many people do you hear talk about RASP? Very few. But we, 
we've taken these approaches, we've, we've worked at ways to how do we get ahead, how do we help our engineers as they're building software, make sure that they're not exposing our environments. One that's near and dear to my heart, I know I have some of my cohort up here, threat modeling. This is another one. <laughs> there we go. So what was it? It was threat model con or threat mod con? Yep. Was yesterday? We produced a number of different frameworks and methodologies for how we can look at our applications and answer the simple question of what could possibly go wrong? Right? That's what threat modeling is. Just tell me what could go wrong with this idea, this thing that I'm going to build. And in fact, that cohort I mentioned, we were all involved in authoring the Threat Modeling Manifesto. We didn't want to let Agile have all the fun. We're going to have a manifesto too. So we've produced all of these wonderful things. And then what about OWASP? What has OWASP done? If you haven't been out there to see this yet, uh, right there on the front page of the OWASP website. This mapping of all of the projects, the various components that have come together as a result of the OWASP community. Some have come, some have gone. It continues to mature over time. You'll see things on there like OWASP SAM, probably one of my favorite all-time OWASP projects. Coming up with a way to actually look at how mature are we in our application security posture. So this is where we're at. These are the things that we've created within web application security and application security in general. Because I know we've renamed OWASP now because we even understood that web application security kind of limiting in scope. So, has it worked? We're getting a lot of attention. The results of everything that we've done is more and more developers are starting to understand that application security is a thing. We're seeing more and more attention in the media. We see it all over the place up here, shifting left in DevOps. Shifting left, shifting left. How many have heard that term before, shifting left? We've been saying shift left for the last 22 years at least. Have we gotten there? I hear laughing when I ask that question. <laughs> and that's about the response I was expecting. How far have we really come? I saw this graphic, by the way, and I love this. All right, how did we get here? Have every effect applied at the same time? Isn't that pretty much what we're asking for with AppSec? We want you to do DAST and SAS and SCA and we want you to create your S-bombs and we want you to, oh, I didn't even talk about S-bombs. We got the government to mandate S-bombs. So we're doing something. But how far have we really come? Let's look at the OS top 10, then and now. There's a lot of similarity there, isn't there? A lot of similarity. Now, now we took injection and you know, we combined a couple things into injection because we realized it was all kind of the same concept and we needed room for other things. Vulnerable and outdated components, we kind of see that. We see insecure configuration management. Well, that never really went away. We had to add a new one there for server-side request forgery because we got into these cloud environments and hello, all sorts of new vulnerabilities. But we still see a lot of the same stuff happening over and over and over again. So let's consider some numbers. Let, let's, let's look back on a survey. 46%, 46% of organizations don't have any form of automated security testing anywhere in their software development pipeline. That's almost half. That's daunting. That's tough. We got a lot to overcome. 29% of that 46%, or of the 54%, rather, 
Only, ha only 29% have application security practices that occur anywhere before we get to the testing cycle. So when we think about shifting left, if we're not doing anything AppSec related until we're in the test phase, how far left did we really get? Not very far, and only 29% of that 54% are doing that. That's a small number if you do the math. And then there's 32%. 32% of organizations say they don't even know if any of their applications have ever been breached. That's not, you know, as far as we know, nothing happened. That's we don't have the ability to go out and even know if they've been breached. That's kind of terrifying as a consumer. Um, you know, my data's out there, your data's out there. So this is, this is where we're at today. Let's talk about some other things that have occurred. If you want to add some context to how far we have to come, I mentioned that open source community before. How many of us had to deal with log for shell That was fun, wasn't it? Great exercise. Hey, patch. Hey, patch again. Hey, patch again. Oh, one more time. It was a simple, essentially, I guess you would chalk it up to an, an injection vulnerability in OWASP terms. Just a, a simple issue in Jindy. But oh, by the way, According to my friends out there at Sneak at the time, 90% of Java apps had Log4j in them somewhere. That's impactful. Spring, not to be outdone, decided a few months later, hey, let us into the game. We've got three CVEs of our own. All right. But it's not just the open source community. How many of you have had to deal with the move it vulnerability? And what was that vulnerability? Does anybody know? SQL injection. SQL injection. SQL injection. We have been fighting SQL injection as long as I've been a developer. We've been told, use parameterized queries, stored procedures, all the, the various elements, right? SQL injection in 2023. And then, of course, cloud. Our friends in cloud. Those insecure configurations. Now, you might argue, well, it's an S3 bucket. That's infrastructure. That's not the app. Tell your DevOps folks that. Right? Everything's the app. And that, vulner that breach, that was earlier this year. That's not, that's not old news. I mean... We've known about S3 buckets and the need to configure them properly for a long time. Eh. Oops. It's still happening. So why? Why, why, why does this keep happening? Now, there's lots of people with lots of ideas. And guess what? I'm no exception. I have all my ideas. And I'm going to share them with you, and I'm going to talk about what I think we can do to get better about this. But let's talk about why this keeps happening. First and foremost, application security is not credible. Point blank. We do more things in AppSec efforts that destroy our credibility with our developers than any other part, honestly, in my opinion, than we do anywhere else in security. Like, I can install a firewall. I hold credibility with my network team. They get it. I go to my AppSec team, and they go and they start talking to the developers, and it's, stop what you're doing. Oh, we got a quality gate. You had too many high severity vulnerabilities on your SAS scan. Stop. You're the problem, Mr. Developer. You're lazy. You don't know what you're doing. You're, you're, you're causing all these issues. 2023, and I still hear people in security talking about lazy developers. Your work is flawed. You continue to point the finger and then say, your work's flawed. You're doing crap. All this does from a cybersecurity perspective 
is take us out of a credible position with our engineering teams, with our development teams, with our product teams. They don't need us coming to them and telling them they're not doing things right and that they're bad or they're evil and, hey, you have to go to this secure code training. That's not building our credibility with those aspects of our organizations. And some of that happens because application security simply is invasive. This is from Sneak, uh, their State of Open Source Security report last year. I like this one um, just because, I mean, I, th I think we've been saying this forever. As long as I can remember that SaaS tools have existed in particular. I mean, you talk about a construct that is just fraught with false positives, massive amounts. How many of you have sent off your code to, you know, s nameless vendor who, you know, scans it for vulnerabilities and you get back a 300 megabyte report? Well, what do I do with that? It's useless. And half of them are false positives. Oh, that code, that's not even reachable. It's in a library somewhere, and we never even talked to that function never gets called. There's no way to get to it. Do I care then? No. But it's not just the tooling. It's what do we do inherently? And I hear this way, way, way too much. It drives me nuts. How do we implement security in a pipeline? Well, you got to have quality gates. You got to put gates in there. You got to have a gate that says, hey, you stop here. If you, if you don't pass this gate, you got to stop and you got to go back. How does that work with your CI/CD pipelines? It doesn't. CI/CD moves one direction. And when you put a gate in there and you say, we're going to rewind the pipeline to here, you broke it. But a lot of people in security who haven't been developers, who haven't been in that CI/CD world, they don't understand this. And our default mode is, we're going to assess your app, we're going to assess your code, and if it's too bad, we're not going to let you move. We're going to tell you to stop, we're going to tell you you did it wrong, and you are the problem. We're invasive. Now, they might throw things at me when I say this next one, but threat modeling. How do we fit threat modeling into, into DevOps? We're getting better. And I guarantee you the people up here that I'm referring to at the moment are the people trying to spearhead that because they understand, like me, the value of it and they love it. But if we aren't doing a good job of taking those frameworks that's a, and applying them appropriately, that's a really daunting thing that in its traditional sense has been very time consuming. You had to have big upfront design cycles and create DFDs and all this stuff, right? I mean, it, it was, that's a lot of work. So we need to be more flexible in how we do that to not be invasive. Here's the one that I start to get in trouble with people. Application security is always treated as an add-on. Originally it was, hey, we have to secure the SDLC, so we'll create the SSDLC. Then DevOps came along in 2008, 2009. We said, well, no, we don't want to do DevOps. We want to do DevSecOps. More to come on that one in a minute. That's a pet peeve of mine. And then, you know, oh, hey, even code reviews. Well, we got code reviews. Code reviews are being done forever, and I don't know why my spacing's off there. That's cool. Um, we're going to create secure code reviews. The point here isn't about the semantics. We can create all the fun terms we want. I don't care. Call it whatever you want. But the problem is this is our methodology, this is our mentality in how we approach these as cybersecurity professionals. We come to this world and we say, well, you're developers, we're security, we're going to bolt on to everything that you do. We're going to take our practices and bolt them into everything it is that you do. And when you do a, a code push, we're going to be right there and we're going to assess it. When you promote that, we're going to take that, you merge that branch, we're going to be there but it's always a bolt on separate activity. We say we want to push left, we say we want to integrate into the pipeline, but then everything we do comes from the standpoint of bolting on security as a separate thing. We're the, uh, the high and mighty security experts. We'll tell you how to secure your development. You ever developed before? No, but I'm gonna tell you how to secure your development. Come on. And then application security is truly, truly hopelessly complex. 
I love everything we've created and I hate everything we've created, okay? Like, there is so much. You've all seen probably the big, you know, the security vendors poster. Did you know that we now have a smaller one that's a subset that's application security? And I don't think that this is even half of the application security vendors out there. This was just the best image I could find from our friends at Enso. Like, all these activities, back to that Minecraft image, right? All the effects at once. We want it all. And rightfully so, there's lots of reasons for that. It's all valid. That's not to disparage anything that we've created over the years. That's not to say anything that we've done is bad or wrong. It's to say we have room to get a lot better. So what can we do? What should we do? What do we do? Let's talk about how we move on from this world. So let's start with... This is back to that lazy developer thing, right? That's a common narrative that I can't stand. Don't confuse motivation and prioritization. It's not that your developers lack motivation. It's not that developers lack motivation in wanting to be secure in their app. It's that security isn't their priority in most organizations. And even when it is, it's still not, <laughs> okay? We might say, we might you know, give them targets they've got to hit for you know, any number of KPIs and metrics around uh, application security. But at the end of the day, what drives our development cycles? It's those timelines, it's feature requests, it's the backlog. How quickly, how many are pushes are we doing? How many releases are we doing? And for CICD, that is like the single thing we look at the most. How fast are our releases hitting? How fast are we deploying? How many deploys per day are we doing? I remember years ago, Amazon bragging that somehow they said that their deploys per day, or they were, it was negative minutes. Like, I, I don't think you understand how temporal things work, but okay. You're good, Amazon. You're good. You're good. But the reality, or actually, I think about it, not Amazon, it was Netflix. Um, doesn't matter. The fact is, that's what, that's what our product teams care about. That's what our engineers care about. That's what our developers care about. And it's because that's the pressure they're getting. The pressure is how quick can we pump out new functionality? How quickly can we pump out new innovation? We want to put LLMs into everything now. Get working on it. They're not coming to security and saying, we want to put LLMs in anything. Can you secure it for us? That's not what happens. So we need to recognize that, first of all. And I'm, I'm a little surprised that in 2023, that's still a conversation that needs to be had. But clearly it is because I get it all the time. I hear it from other cybersecurity experts, practitioners even on my own team. It's, it's not laziness, it's not a lack of motivation, it's a difference in priorities. So how else do we go about fixing this? Well, we need to start accepting sh real shared responsibility. If I go back to that DevOps conversation, if I go back to 2008, when Andrew Schaefer and Patrick Dubois got together and said, you know what, Dev and Ops, we keep fighting. Can't we all just get along and make this happen better? Oh, we could create this thing, DevOps. The whole point of that was to create shared responsibility between the development teams and the operations teams where everybody was responsible for the stability and for the speed of deployment. Developers want to deploy fast. They want to keep their works in progress to a minimum. That is their goal. Operations, they're focused on uptime and responsiveness. What does our performance look like on that app? Is it up when we need it up? So how does security enter this mix? Because you got security, we're worried about eliminating vulnerabilities and defending the systems. The real DevSecOps happens in the middle. And what that means is we as security are taking ownership of the need to deploy fast. We in security are taking ownership of uptime. I was just talking with Vendana before, we, before I got up here, and 
you know, I mentioned to her, you know, I, I went from being in software development to being in security for an organization to consulting for many years, and now I'm a CISO. I'm on every single incident call, whether it's security related or not. Why? Because at the end of the day, we all own that. I can't stand here and say we're going to do DevSecOps and then have security only worrying about security and saying, hey, security is everybody's job. Oh, great. If I'm a developer, you say security is my job? OK, cool. Here, programming is now your job. I can't, I can't just hand that to you and not take that active part. We have to be part of that. And so how do we start to do that? We need to look at our metrics and our KPIs. How are we measuring what we do? How many security people in here are actually including deployment times or sprints completed or anything like that in your KPIs? I see one, two, three, four, five maybe hands. That's what I'm talking about. All of this, instead of going into some metrics meeting, maybe you, you, know, you meet with your, your executive team, or maybe there's some senior leadership thing where you present your metrics, and it's security goes up and presents theirs, then product teams to present theirs, and then the operations teams present theirs. Bring that together. Make sure everybody's accountable. If we've got a slowdown in our deployments, Everybody's accountable for understanding why and helping to fix that. If you're seeing, you know, uh, let, let's say insecure configurations on servers, yeah, security, maybe you didn't build that server, but you could probably help out. Maybe, what are they doing? They're enabling, you know, let's, let's pick an easy one. They're enabling insecure encryption ciphers, right? That, that's a common one. I don't know how serious a vulnerability that really is, but it's something we're trying to stamp out. So even if it's an ops team, or worse yet, it was a developer who created a container, how can we in security look at how can we improve that? How can we give them better tooling that helps them catch that? How can we look at what they're, you know, if they're leveraging AMIs, what, where are those AMIs coming from? How, why is that ending up that way? What can we do to be a part of that to make their lives easier? And flowing right from this is be part of product development. How many of you in this room have access to your development team's backlogs? How many of you actually look at them? <laughs> All right, fair. So we have like maybe 40% of the room has access and it dropped to like 30%, but that's okay because it's a start. But being able to see the backlog and understand what's there, go and actually attend stand-ups and be a part of that. Make yourself part of that organization. We're going to talk about shifting left. If I can't be there in the backlog somewhere, how am I shifting left? That's, that's shifting left. I can't go any further left than that. My friends up here in the threat modeling world, I've got to stop picking on them, um, know that this is, this is something I've been talking about for a long time. Why are we not threat modeling at the point that I create a user story? If I'm going to put a user story in there. What if I just threat model that user story? Can't I get all the information right then and there? I don't need to create a huge data flow diagram, at least not right away. Maybe I can look at that and say, hey, you know what? If I'm going to start collecting this data, or I'm going to start using this functionality in this way, or I'm going to open up this API to this additional you know, third-party service or whatever, all of that comes with specific threats that I can calculate, and it doesn't take a security engineer to do that. A developer, a business analyst, can look at those things and say, you know what? Those are some things that could go wrong. I should probably make note of that. <laughs> and yes, I threw this one in here, and I know people are laughing because they know this was my former role. But embrace the BISO function. And I don't necessarily mean we have to create BISOs everywhere. If you haven't heard of the BISO yet, the Business Information Security Officer, something that's been talked about a lot, but implemented in a lot of different ways. Here's the point. The BISO, in my very biased opinion, because I used to be one, is a two-way conduit 
to a bridge between your security organization and your product development teams. Now, when I say two-way, I mean two-way because, yes, they are there to bring a security message to the masses. We want that. We want them involved early. We want that to be the person who knows what's going on, who knows what's in the backlog, who knows what the projects are that are coming up, who knows you know, what user stories are, are getting pulled into work in progress. Right? We want them there. But what I want more from my BISO, and I told her this when I hired her, I want the BISO, or whoever fills that role, even if we don't call it that, to be the advocate on the part of the product development team. I want them coming back to me and saying, Alyssa, this idea you have to implement this new whiz bang thing is completely going to destroy this development organization. We have got to do it a different way. Here's what I think we need to do. That's what I want the BISO doing. The BISO can help be a part of, I know Security Champions is getting a ton of talk this year at this conference. I've heard it in a lot of places, and I was talking to somebody about it. I mentioned it, and they're like, yeah, everybody's talking about that. Let your BISO be the part of creating that community. They should be the one that fosters it, but they shouldn't drive it. And when I say community, that's the value of a security champions program. It's not that, oh, we have security-minded people in development. No. It's that you create a community of them across your product development organization where they come together and they discuss security-related topics. How do we fix this thing? Oh, hey, I just fixed that, that same type of thing last week. Or, hey, we created this new library you can use, and security already looked at the architecture of it. Or, hey, we worked with security, and we created this new thing. Or, hey, security, you know what? We could really use a reference architecture for how we do this. Could you help us build it? All of those are the concepts. That's, what, that's the discussion we want happening in that community when we talk about security champions. That's where the value of it comes from. It's not from security having you know, this, this extra little you know, insider. I mean, maybe that's kind of cool, but you know, it's just, that's not what's going to get us there. That's not going to help with that credibility either. Fostering this type of collaboration this type of, you know, communication, that's where we start to show the value we're bringing to the development organizations. So, just about time for me to wrap up. I want to leave you with this quote. I, this is, it is amazing how many talks I give that this quote fits into, but it does fit here. We've done lots of really good things in the 22 years that OWASP has been around. We have done lots of good things in the minimum of 27 years that I've been in this industry. So yes, now I just told you, 27 years of driving application security awareness. But at the end of the day, there is so much more we need to continue to do. How can we learn from both the good that we've done and the mistakes that we've made and continue to drive forward? Because there's no end state to this. We all understand that. We just have to be focused on continuous improvement. How are we getting better tomorrow? What is the one little small incremental thing I can do to make sure that tomorrow is a slightly brighter day than today in terms of AppSec within my org? That's what I'm focused on. So before I run off the stage here really quickly, if you want to get in touch with me, I always welcome you all to uh, please continue the conversation. The one caveat I will say up here, LinkedIn is at the bottom for a reason. If you connect with me there, great. Don't bother sending me a private message because I'll never get it. <laughs> Unfortunately, LinkedIn has kind of destroyed private messaging on that platform. It's become unusable, so I won't see it if you do. But any of the others on my website, there is a contact form. It'll go straight to my email. So feel free to email me, connect with me on Blue Sky or Mastodon. We'd love to hear from you, hear your thoughts, your questions, your ideas. How do we keep getting better? Thank you so much, everybody. Take care.